So thank you for being here. You are actually really brave. I you know presenting something like this in a conference that's all about search. It's interesting. How many of you know Hanbal? Oh, quite a lot. Then we're going to be OK. Um, so my name is Pere. Been doing that thing for a long time. And one of the things that interests me always is data, distributed systems, search, machine learning. And I basically grew up playing handball in a country that only plays football. Yeah? I grew up in Barcelona. Um, so yeah. Um, what are we going to see today? Mostly is a little bit of why. Yeah? Why this? Um, what people has been doing. And then we are going to do a small demo of basically doing something that's called play classification more or less all together. Yeah? It's somehow prepared because it's impossible to do, you know, to code everything in, 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 in five minutes or ten minutes. Yeah? Um, yeah, so let's go. All of you know what's handball, so it doesn't need too much introduction. Handball is a sport that's played usually with uh, six field players in each mannschaft and uh, two goalkeepers. And the intention is always uh, to uh, put the ball you know, as more times to the other guy's uh, <laughs> goal as in yours. Yeah? Um, it's actually, that this is a uh, professional team in Berlin, and that's uh, Barcelona, yeah? the professional team in Barcelona. And this is how it looks um, from the higher level. Yeah? So this would be actually part of the work I've, I've uh, done uh, uh, that I'm actually kind of, kind of showing here. Yeah? This would be a counterattack uh, situation where one team is moving fast from their zone yeah, to the other place. And these are the trajectories of the different players. Yeah? Um, there are many um, kind of moves in handball. It could be defense, attack. You know, so different kind of, of actions that happen. This is just the, the, the representation as an image. As you can see here, there is something that's interesting. It's the trajectories, yeah? To see what the players are doing. So, yeah, what others are already doing. In, like in the, when you go to read things about that stuff, this is football, handball, basketball, all these games are called invasion sports. Yeah? Um, but how can um, AI or KAI help handball teams? Handball is not like football or basketball. There is literally no money. Yeah? The investments or the amount of money that move even basketball, that's not the same like, like football, is not in the biggest mannschaft or the biggest teams in the handball. So money is not there. And who is going to analyze and support the teams is usually one guy that supports multiple teams in the same club. Even for Barcelona, who is, you know, he has a lot of money. Yeah, the analyst who helps analyze the games is not, no, there's not like a huge team like in, 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 uh, in football. And even more interesting for me is the current technology advances, yeah? For example, right now, the HBL, the German Bundesliga, works with a German company called Kinexon, yeah? who's able to do indoor tracking. So all games in the Bundesliga of handball, yeah, they are tracked to the, to the millimeter of what the players are doing. Where are they moving? Where are they throwing? What's the ball location? Yeah? Something that is kind of interesting to have for this kind of analysis. Yeah. Um, and they are presenting, except the tracking of the players, yeah? They are presenting lots of this data available on, the, on, on their website, yeah? Who shot the fastest? Who was the best goalkeeper? What were the areas where they shoot, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a really a lot of effort in, in, in gathering this information. But how can AI help handball teams? Basically, to get a better understanding of the opponent. Yeah? You see lots of videos, you want to go to a different team yeah? and see what the hell are they doing. What are their place strength, etc., etc. And most important, when this is done by a human, it's unreliable. Yeah? It's way best effort, and it's mostly done only 
using video data. Yeah? Um, as most of you could know, yeah, you can get from these videos, locations, positions of players, and automate all of this to help this poor one or two guys or ladies who are doing that job uh, for, uh, for literally a lot of work for nothing. Yeah? We could make better search. We could make more accurate uh, play segmentation yeah? to uh, do this, this work. But why bother? Um, what is play classification? That's actually an example we're going to do later on. Yeah? Imagine you are doing an, an offense, an attack, in any sports, basketball, football, or handball. It's like a choreography. It's a dance where one player moves one, did one location and another does something else in order to score. Yeah? And this is actually something that most of the analysis is done. What, what are the strategies of the other team? Yeah? And this um, could be like a very simple problem, like basic binary classification, or could be something like a multi-label uh, classification, yeah? where you want to categorize multiple kind of plays. Yeah? It's actually interesting that a lot of work has been done in the past for that, but for moving cameras. Yeah, like in the biggest stadiums, to move cameras left and right. That kind of play classification is, OK, it's an attack on the left. It's an attack on the right. But it doesn't help the teams. It helps the cameras and the studios to move the things faster, yeah? It's actually interesting. The guys, that, the guys did it for the Spanish Handball Liga, yeah? And they were using Kanban, Kalman and Bevings, yeah? Because when you need to move the cameras, yeah? If you're using um, um, neural networks to do that kind of decision, it goes way too slow for the move that they, uh, the speed that, that they needed. Some ca another kind of play classification that I found very interesting when I was doing that work is a work doing by a team of uh, Czech uh, Republic guys, yeah, who did it for basketball. What was interesting here is only they did it only with location, yeah, only with indoor tracking of people extracted from, from videos, they built a semantic classification of the place, basically allowing people to search that stuff. Because if not, we're like, like, like back then in the movies, yeah? when people needed to classify um, uh, movies and things, I don't know, like in, in uh, big television uh, um, series, yeah? for then doing the search manually. Yeah? So this helps a lot or help a lot, that kind of work that they, that they did. But what is another thing that was actually uh, very interesting or people is doing uh, uh, in this area is the expected possession value. Basically, if in the next couple of minutes or n number of seconds, there's going to be a goal or not. Yeah? So you know if your team is better or you can actually score your opponents if they have a bigger score. You know? Like in FIFA, where you have a, this is a 100 or is a 99, yeah? Um, and this is actually done by professional handball teams in Germany, like the TBV Lembolipe, yeah? who did actually an interesting work in here, where they tested a lot of uh, different algorithms to do this uh, uh, predict the, the goal problem. Yeah? They tested neural networks, and the best one was gradient boosting. Yeah? So sometimes we go to deep learning, we go to all of that kind of stuff, and Traditional stuff, traditional algorithms or more common algorithms works quite well. Or the work that, that these uh, uh, folks um, did with uh, Flensburg Hannebit. Yeah? This, if some of you might know or not, is uh, the current Europa Meister uh, in handball. So they are actually quite good and have a lot of money because they uh, work with um, Paderborn University. Uh, like very small university, but it's still a university. Um, and they did uh, a work to uh, do this scoring. What I found interesting about uh, this work yeah, is that they were using transformers. Yeah? So these guys only work with, uh, with uh, deep learning uh, models. But what are the challenges? Yeah? Why do we do that? And what are the problems that people usually face here? Data set are extremely unbalanced, yeah? Extremely unbalanced. There is a lot of um, situations that are negative for a very few that are positive. And in, in handball, that's not so unbalanced like in football, 
But in football, you make four scores, you know, and you make a lot of more tries. Something that is interesting is um, there is a requirement to do a lot of resampling, yeah, or do data augmentation in this kind of problems. However, data augmentation is done like, um, let's put it like very simply, yeah. So you have, like, you have the game in horizontal, you put it vertical, yeah, and this kind of stuff. Because the use of generative AI, it's not that explore for helping the team solve these kind of problems. It's explore for search, it's explore for a lot of stuff, but not for, for example, for predicting actions or, or generating this kind of work. For sure, you don't get data. I got lucky for that work that I was working with a university in, in Tarragona, in, in, in Catalonia, that I got access to extremely small biased data set. But if not, you, it's, this data is mostly private. And data sets that are available, when they are, they are extremely biased. Yeah? So it is one team in one season, only guys from Germany. What in this area is totally irrelevant if you want to build a more generic model. Yeah? Or it's only female. My case, for example, the data set that I was using for this work is only female from Catalonia, so it's very, very biased. And a lot of the problems that you see as well is how you're going to report that stuff. Yeah? In an unbalanced, data, an unbalanced data set that you want to predict if the results are actually good. Some of the things I found very problematic or things that I actually found is the use of the area under the curve. Yeah? This alone tells you nothing. You need this plus something else to understand it better. If it's actually good or it's or it's you know, uh, not, uh, not uh, very good. Huh? You have as well, you need to work with uh, metrics that balance precision and recall. Because this ba these models are very unbalanced, you can get a lot of recall and not so good precision, yeah? What not so good for results at the end. And now the interesting part. Uh, if I'm talking uh, too fast, uh, please uh, tell me. Yeah, I'm from Barcelona, so I tend to talk quite fast myself. <laughs> Let's make this a little bit bigger. Uh, font. Uh, ah. ah, here. Yeah, maybe now it's okay. Yep. So what do we have here? By the way, this is like public available if you want in this, yeah, in here, except the data, because you know I cannot share the data until the university allows me to do that. <laughs> um yeah, but all the code is 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 uh, here available, yeah. Um how the data looks like. It looks like, like this. Yeah. So you get multiple players, player 0, player 1, player 2, player 3, yeah? And you get x and y. These are the trajectories that, that they are doing. Sometimes, in the case of my data set, it was so crappy that uh, sometimes the sensors were failing, yeah? Or the timestamps were wrong. But, you know, suppose that they are OK. Then you get only these uh, uh, annotations, sorry, these uh, trajectories that are indoor coordinates, yeah? And you get some kind of analysis, yeah? What is the benefit here? And what is everybody trying to do right now? Get the analysis mostly only out of coordinates. Because then I can help the human don't make mistakes or make fewer mistakes, yeah? Interesting attributes that you can see here are, for example, the situation. Are both teams playing with the same number of, uh, of players? Or is one playing with more players. Yeah? In handball, you get a two minutes exclusion. Yeah? So one team can play uh, with a less players. Or if you are breaking the attack in multiple sequences. Yeah? It's known in handball, like in basketball, if uh, you have less sequences in, a, in, a, in an attack, it's more probably that you're going to score. Or 
you can have the offense type. If it's static uh, attack or if it's organized or not, yeah? Basically, the organized is if it's play classification, if it's an, ad, an a strategy that, that they are doing. Here, for simplification, it's basically binary, but you can have here as many labels as you want, if you want to categorize this uh, better, yeah? Or you can have where is the person throwing, what the part of the field the person is throwing, yeah? Again, there is correlation depending on where and wh how much distance is for the player when it throws to the, to the, uh, to the keeper, if it's going to score or not. But first, before you do that, you need, sorry, um, you need to make encodings, right? Because we cannot put like a possession who is a multiple time series in our, uh, a random forest. Or if we do it in, in deep learning, you know, we have to use a special like a, like a tensor for that, yeah? One thing we can do is a calculate centroids, yeah? We calculate the centroids of each player and the distances among them, and the velocities, yeah? And this kind of stuff. This is one way to summarize the, the, thing, the thing. Or we can do something even more stupid. That is to do like this, yeah? If you have the, the possession that is a vertical, yeah? Sorry, that is a, a, yeah, a, a vertical, we make it horizontal. You know? Then you get the... the um, uh, y3, uh, location for play is zero, etc., 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 yeah? Or you can do something else that actually what I did in this, in this job, by the way, I didn't say it, but this is part of my master thesis for university, yeah? Is to use autoencoders, yeah? LSTM autoencoders, yeah? What is interesting um, attribute of, of uh, these LSTM autoencoders is when you uh, do an attack or an offense, yeah? Usually players, what I do is dependent on what other people is doing, yeah? And what the opponents are doing. So this relationship among what everybody is doing, it needs to be learned somehow. And here is, I have all, all this prepared, yeah? It does like uh, the attribute selection, like this of, is offense metadata with what is throwing, um, the scoring, the times the previous results for the history, et cetera, et cetera. This first example is with, um, um, with machine learning models, yeah, with traditional mach machine learning algorithms, yeah? And what it does is you select a target attribute, if it's organized or not, or the result, if it's score or not. It's only working with offensive data, yeah? What we saw before. It gets the data set already. It does, if configured, the required transformation, yeah? So you are not working, uh, only working with a number and all the encoding required. And something that is actually quite interesting. It uses for sure um, cross-validation and the folding, yeah? Because we are working with games, one of the traditional failures that people does here is a worker with a this strategy, with a stratified. But the unit of work in here is the possession that is within a game, yeah? So if you actually divide your data set with this, you can have in the training part and in the testing part possessions of the same game, yeah? Well, this is not good. It's a data leak, yeah? So that's why I use uh, this uh, group um, cafolding, yeah? So you take like uh, nine games. In my case, the data set was uh, 10 games, yeah? You take nine games for a training and one for testing, yeah? And you repeat that 10 times. Now, this is what it's doing here, yeah? It does resampling, it selects the algorithm, already the configuration is done, you know, does a grid search to find a good parameter, and then does, does a training test. So, for example, something that is quite interesting is, now we can test uh, with uh, the centroid algorithm, the centroid encoding, yeah? So remember, we took these trajectories, yeah? And found the middle point for the team and for the players, and then the distances. So it's like a geometry, yeah? It's like a geometry. So um, we take the group, we don't do resampling, yeah? We select only the centroid and its distances, yeah? And we try to predict if, it's, if the uh, game was organized or not.
So here you can see the attributes that it's using, yeah, for different players, the distances, centroids, the team centroids as well. Yeah, so it's only coordinate data, yeah? And using gradient boosting, after a while, it's able to get yeah, around 70 um, average F1 score. What is not extremely perfect, but it's not extremely wrong as well, yeah? Because it, it only works with coordinates, yeah? For trying to decide if it's organized or not. For example, we could say now, apart from this uh, uh, centroid, the distance, etc., we add the time. You can see now here that uh, it says the possession, how many seconds it took, yeah? You can see afterwards that we get to 0 0.76. What again? It's not like an ID, yeah? But it already gives you a lot of information that you are going through a good, uh, a good approach. What I found quite interesting is the gradient boosting um, performs quite well, but when you compare with uh, uh, k-means, uh, for example, it is not so bad. Yeah? So if we try the same strategy right now with k-means, hopefully randomness will not screw my demo. Yeah, it's 0 0.78. 68, sorry. Yeah? What for an algorithm that goes way faster than you, what you can do with a random forest, yeah? It's not so bad when you want to decide things faster when you're doing, for example, a video segmentation, yeah? Random forest takes time. What is interesting as well is now we said with time, but what happened if as well I put metadata, yeah? Now I put for organize a game if it's going to score, um, what it score, you know, so I put a, this, this kind of metadata in. You see? So now here it says like the throw zone, it says the duration, it says the number of sequences, the, the offense type, yeah, the tactical situation, etc. Yeah. And remember, before it was I think 0 0.78, yeah, without this. So really, for deciding if the game is organized or not, I don't care about metadata. Yeah, I care only about what the players are doing. Yeah, and this is something that's really quite interesting for helping the teams. Even most interesting is, now I want to do it, yeah? But I'm going to do it with the LSTM autoencoders that you saw before. For sure, this is already prepared, you know, like uh, this is all the data encoded, beautiful, you know, and everything is prepared before <laughs> because otherwise we stay here for hours. Um, and uh, this is the, the, the Excel that you were seeing before, yeah, with all of this data, so it's the exact same data set, but to store in an H5 uh, file, yeah? Let's see what happens. You see now, basically, it takes the encodings, yeah? And the metadata that we put in. Seventy-two, what's not so bad as well, and it could do, and it could do better uh, if uh, you try it multiple times. Sorry, one second. <coughs> Sorry, a uh, cough. Yeah, um, you can try as well with a flatten, yeah, and other of these strategies. However, what is interesting for me as well is to see how the hell deep learning is going to do. Yeah, so I built the same thing using a deep learning. Yeah, and in a deep learning, basically I compare. Um, in uh, this exercise, uh, multiple architectures. Yeah? The first one that is interesting to me is uh, this one here. This is using Keras. Yeah? It's like a extremely simple network to do classification uh, with uh, dense uh, uh, layers yeah? and uh, with a uh, word embedding at the beginning. Yeah? So it gets all the locations. Yeah? It um, um, Move the numbers, so at the end, any number is like a word, yeah? Because I multiply by 10,000, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, yeah? And then at this layer is able to learn the encoding itself. Another interesting network that I compared in here 
is a time series transformer. Yeah? So transformers that are used as well for uh, te text um, a lot. You can see as well this idea applied to time series as well. To, to time series as well yeah? This is basically here. You can see, like, uh, here you can see, like, uh, like uh, the initial part, yeah? That's the attention. And then you can see the, the latest part that is uh, to do the classification without the dense and the sigma, yeah? This model or this part is only working with, um, with a location, yeah? So it's only working with the coordinates of the players within the, the, um, the field. So if we go here, oops, not like down here. Yeah, we have this at the raw data set. This is in a structure like before. You know, oh, um, before that, I forgot uh, to one example here. Sorry. Um, so this was for play classification, yeah? But what would happen if now I try to do possession result? No? I try to predict scoring. You know? My professor, when I did that work, was like, okay, that's uh, like going into a betting, yeah? You go to a betting and you say, that's going to win 32 to a 30, yeah? If I, you do that thing here, this, remember, still is from the machine learning uh, part, yeah? But I wanted to show this as well. <coughs> oh, no, that's not what I wanted. Um, Ah, now I, anyway, I show you later. But uh, <laughs> that part is actually getting as well 75, uh, um, 0 0.75 to predict scoring, what is quite interesting at the end. Going back to uh, the deep learning part, yeah, dense uh, architecture with a word embedding and try to predict if uh, it's going to be um, an organized game or not. Yeah, we can try this one here. This one takes a little bit longer. You can see here all the executions of the cross-validation as well. Sometimes the tensor flow gets funny. Oh, no. That's not what I wanted. Let's try it again. Yeah, now it's a uh, uh, tensor, uh, like uh, Keras is not a breaking in the ID. Um, it's interesting with its dense model, yeah? It gets very low information. Remember, it's only with a trajectory. So to decide if a game is organized, at the end you need uh, probably to do this execution with a bigger epoch, yeah, with a different configuration in here, yeah? And this one was using as well no data augmentation. We can try as well with data augmentation. But it's not going to be like bigger, you know. At the end, in my experiments, it never went bigger than 0 0.6, yeah, in the average F1. We can see here, for example, one of the things I was saying before. Some of the tries of this data, because it's so unbalanced, yeah? It's 0 0.8 precision, 0 0.59 recall. What, you know, complicated to say it's going to be OK or not if you only present the under the curve metrics, yeah? And at the end, see, 0 0.43. So usually these models need on not only the location, but need to der derive um, attributes from the location. Like, where are certain people throwing the ball? 
what are the opponents doing, yeah, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. Um, and in this data set, it's only one team. So this is one of the problems from this kind of uh, exercises that you get biased data somehow, yeah? And less of uh, this right now. Oops, what is this thing? Nope. Let's go to my backup. <laughs> So that's, this is my backup for demo when demo does not good, you know, I get the results from experiment at home, yeah? <laughs> um, in this part here, you see the organized game. Uh, this is, uh, it was running for multiple days, trying uh, different combinations of data, yeah, and then putting them in, on Instagram. You can see here that the, the average F1 score, you can see here the number of times that each algorithm was hitting in here, yeah? So you can see that, uh, in this uh, case, you can see that the blue area, the random forest and other both, and actually the green, like the LGBM, was getting the best, being the random forest the best one. However, that stuff takes time to train and to execute. So, yeah. Um, but it was interesting that, uh, that uh, you can get to a, a good uh, uh, or a relatively good uh, information with a limited information and mostly with information about the trajectories of the players. And what is very interesting is that for the other problem, for the, the, the possession result, so the scoring, if it's going to score or not, what is important to get like, to the higher level of results is to use sequences, yeah? To break the possession in a smaller number because there is correlation of how, many, how long the possession is taking, if it's going to score or not, yeah? So it's a big correlated information in here. Oops. Nope, like now. As I said, the demo, if you want to play, is available here as well. The presentation, yeah? Study the data set till probably a more couple of months till it's published. It will not be available, but then it will be available as well for everybody. And thank you. Questions? Hope I didn't bore too much you on an early morning. Uh, <laughs> see a question here. Thank you so much for this talk. It was <clears throat> a real treat. Uh, I was wondering, since you're building different kinds of models and exploring uh, neural embeddings to do the classification, have you tried stacking models uh, and specifically using the initial score initialization in boosted trees that is available in LGBM? Um, I mean, I was doing random forest, but with not so much of classification. But for the stacking models, I have did not, because this was a limited work for my master thesis this year in university. Yeah, um, but it's part of what is interesting to to explore, to explore ensembles, to explore like building agents around that thing. Because if what I was trying to show here, different problems with different kind of attributes, so you need to. Uh, look for specialized models to do that, yeah? You should definitely look into uh, the init score parameter in LGBM. Yep. I'm pretty sure there's some performance to be gained there. I'm probably sure as well. <laughs> do we have more questions in the audience? Hmm. The lady. Ah, there's ask one more. Thanks. Thank you for the talk. This was great. Um, I was wondering if you have started exploring how y you can use this in order to like predict what is the best next thing to do in order to increase the chance of a, a goal, or if that is kind of like outside the scope of what you think this can be used for. I don't think this for handball it makes sense to use it because the sport is very fast, yeah, and usually players you know think by themselves. What is interesting, however, is how to support the coach yeah, in the two, uh, changing strategies, like changing the defense system, changing the offense system, yeah? and that is interesting. Or even if it's like you know, something to discuss a long time, um, could be interesting as well as to help a video referee 
Yeah? So it's not for predicting what's next best to do, but uh, to uh, decide if it's a fault or not, you know, and uh, this kind of thing. Because that's controversial, not only in handball, in football, in basketball, everywhere, and uh, these kind of things. But that part is, was something interesting, and I think that there's some people trying to uh, help coaches as well, not only analysts, yeah? So, but nothing I did myself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't see any hands. Any curious people here? Do you have more questions? Maybe I can ask a question. Please. As a beginner data scientist, um, why do you think is it so difficult to only have this region under the curve that you mentioned? Oh, that's an old man run, you know? <laughs> as, the, as the Germans say, I'm an alte Hase. Um, because area under the curve, it gives a higher number, yeah? or relatively higher number for something that could be biased between precision and recall. Mm. Yeah? And when I want to do this kind of prediction, for example, I need a good precision and a good recall. Because if I am you know, only collecting a certain amount of positive data and then predicting among them very good, I'm missing a lot of information then. Mm. So I love to see area under the curve, but I want to see then, I know, other information that tells me how good it, uh, this area under the curve was performing. Mm. Okay, I see. Thank you. <laughs> give context. Always give context. <laughs> All right. I think... Do you have more questions? No. You look so curious. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it's an interesting area, you know, and not much people is working. And right now, the data is flowing more and more. You can see Bundesliga, who is, even for handball, that's a minority sport, doing a lot of that work already. You have three more minutes if you want to um, show us some more examples. <laughs> Otherwise, um, thanks a lot for your talk. Thank you. And uh, you have three more minutes of coffee break now. <laughs> It's a good for coffee break. <laughs>